ultimate talk of the of the conference is from Gideon Yaffe, uh, who I guess uh, has three appointments, right? Uh, law, philosophy, and psychology, and he'll be talking about omission and the proper objects of criminal liability. Thanks. Yes, the ultimate talk. So, um, so I'm going to do something. So I'm going to talk from PowerPoint, and my uh, I'm just using the PowerPoint. I'm not going to read anything. So the upside of reading things, as commentators know, is that then what the commentator responds to is what the speaker actually <laughs> gave to the commentator. Um, so I fear that there may be a gap. So if it looks like Kim is completely not understanding what I said, I'm sure that's my fault, because it means that she did understand what I sent her, and then I said something different. So um, apologies for that if that's what happens. Um, OK. so. I should say, I, I, had, I had an aspiration when I wrote this paper, and I actually even thought that I was, might be meeting it when I sent the paper to Kim. And I've come to believe that I'm falling short of that aspiration. But the aspiration was to solve what I'm calling on this slide the omission problem. Um, that is, uh, there's a famous problem in philosophy of action about what you, so you've got, uh, we all recognize that if, if, a, if a person D engages in an act A, then that means that there's some um, related event that occurs. I say here an A event. Uh, I don't want to have to say, so I'm thinking, for instance, that if D kills, there is a death. And then there's additional conditions that need to be added for there to be an action, the action of killing. And it's a hard problem to figure out precisely what those conditions are and to specify them in non-circular ways and so on. Well-known problem. Comparable problem um, for omission, which is that, I would put it this way, that where there's an omission to act, omission to A, like an omission to kill, there is the absence of a related event. So in this case, the absence of a death, um, barring some of the suggestions, some of the points that Carolina made in, um, in an earlier talk. But there is going to be some event which needs to be absent. I would say, in this instance, the absence of a death, for instance. And then there's got to be additional conditions that you need to add for it to be the case that there's an omission to kill. So my death is not taking place right now, I like to believe. Um, but it's not the case that anybody's omitting to kill me, I also like to believe. But what would the additional conditions need to be added for you to turn the, um, for you to make it the case that uh, my killing was being omitted? Um, now, the solution to this action omission problem, to each of these individual problems, it would be great if it had the following implication. That is, if, if it served to explain something, which is that actions and omissions seem like particularly, pro pro particularly proper or appropriate objects of responsibility assessment. Um, they seem like, um, I mean, action anyway, seem particularly, certainly, seems like a paradigm instance of the kind of thing for which people are to be held responsible. And that seems like it must follow from, be explained by, be connected to something about the nature of what action is. And similarly, for omission. Omissions, you know, there's criminal laws littered with cases of people who um, do awful things, and also littered with cases of people who, you might say, do, who fail to do things and thereby are doing awful things. Um, so these look like proper objects of responsibility. Shouldn't the nature of the thing help us to explain why they are proper objects? Now, I'm particularly interested in criminal liability. Um, I take criminal responsibility to be necessary but not sufficient for criminal liability. Criminal liability is going to require other things besides criminal responsibility. For instance, it's going to have to require the uh, absence of a defense, for instance. Um, but and I also think, I'm coming to think, that the things I'm going to say here about the action omission problem um, are going to help to explain why omission is a proper object of criminal responsibility. And it's not necessarily going to serve to explain why omission is a proper object of moral responsibility. Um, the reason for this, and this I hope will become clear by the end, is that is because of this one important 
I mean, there, I'm sure there are others, there are many others, but this one important difference between moral and criminal responsibility, which is that criminal responsibility ex it entails the existence of a state justifiably, who can justifiably hold the criminal responsible. Um, you're not criminally responsible in a world where there is no state, in the state of nature, you might be morally responsible for all kinds of terrible things that you do, but you're not criminally responsible for anything. Why not? Because there is no state. The state's required for there to be criminal responsibility. And this, oddly enough, as we're going to see, I think, this fact is, I think, important to understand why it is that omissions are proper objects of criminal responsibility. So I think I'm figuring out or discovering here. Okay. Now, so how do you think about what does this mean, a proper object of criminal liability? Uh, what does that even mean? What would, how do you know what that, like, there's a phenomenon here I'm trying to explain, the, f the phenomenon of those, of omissions being proper objects of criminal liability. What do I even mean by that? Um, so one mistake to avoid in thinking that you're going to get, give meaning to that is to think that you know what is meant by this for relation. This is a lesson I've learned from, from Doug, <laughs> who's done probably more than anybody in pointing out that nobody actually knows what they mean when they say, that guy's criminally responsible for this, or they mean a huge variety of different things in different contexts. And you can see this just by thinking about um, commonplace sorts of examples. I, I actually thought of this originally because uh, I, I was having a conversation with a friend who decries the way the legal system um, treats the mentally ill. And she would repeatedly say of, for instance, florally psychotic people who commit, who you know, cause terrible harm, who then turn out to be held criminally liable for a variety of different reasons, say, for instance, because they live in a state that excludes evidence of their mental illness. Um, that she would say, they're, they're just being held criminally responsible for their mental illness. You know, and that looks like a plausible claim from some points of view, depending on what you mean by criminally responsible for. There is some sense in which that's true. Of course, there's another sense in which what they're being held criminally responsible for is shooting four people in a parking lot or whatever it is that they did while florally psychotic. Um, and I think what you find is that when you start to think about what that phrase, what we're criminally responsible for, it moves around in different contexts in ways that, makes you, that should make you nervous that you know what we're talking about. So I do not want to rest on intuitions, particularly not intuitions, or nor am I even going to propose a theory exactly of what is meant by what we are criminally responsible for, what, and then on the other side, what a proper object of criminal liability actually is. But I think that there is a way, nonetheless, of getting at the issue. Um, and that's to think of it, I think, this way, which is that if there's ever been a quintessential object, proper object of criminal responsibility, it's voluntary action. So maybe we can piggyback on that to try to understand why it is that omissions are proper objects of criminal responsibility. Here's what I have in mind. That is a way to think about it, a way to kind of conceptualize what's going on is that a discovery or a finding or a showing that a particular person engaged in a voluntary act, it eases the case for their criminal liability in a particular way. It removes what you might say, it removes an impediment to holding them criminally liable in light of a showing of a harm. So for instance, V's dead. A variety of facts serve to justify criminal liability assigned to D. What facts? Well, causation of the death by something about D. That's a big one. Um, a mental state on D's part with respect to the death. Uh, a voluntary action by D. Thought, my thought is, each of these kinds of conditions that you find, that there's something which you think would be missing for the justifiability of, a, of an assignment of criminal liability until you find that that condition is present. And so the thought is, there's something that's missing which you find present where you have a voluntary act. Let's ask ourselves, when can you supply that same thing by an absence. And when you supply that same thing, when you remove that same impediment to criminal liability um, in, light of the, in light of an absence, 
then that's going to give us an account of what it is for an absence to count as an omission. That is, for an absence to be such as to remove the same obstacle to criminal liability that is removed by voluntary action. Okay? And this gives us a kind of two-phase project. Um, first, identify the impediment to justify criminal liability that's removed when there's a relevant voluntary action. This just amounts to saying it's a necessary condition for justified criminal liability. But anyway, we should identify what necessary condition is met when you have a voluntary action. And then identify the necessary and sufficient conditions under which the absence of an event can remove that same impediment and in the same way and for the same reasons. The result's going to give us, I say here boldly, a solution to the omission problem. Less boldly, sort of, because as we're going to see by the end, I don't think it actually gives me a solution. Not the solution quite that I want to the omission problem. But I, no, I think it nonetheless says something important about why omissions matter to criminal responsibility. OK. So what's the impediment to criminal liability removed by voluntary action? Doug quoted this section from the Model Penal Code. Um, I think we both agree, and it's widely agreed, that this is extraordinarily unhelpful philosophically for identifying what it is that is important about, I mean, it gives you actually truly nothing about what's important about voluntary action or omission. Um, it's also not even clear what its content is. Uh, I mean, since it's taken to exclude things, that it doesn't seem on its face necessarily to exclude in the absence of some real theory about what this based on means. So for instance, this is taken to exclude liability on a showing only that a defendant is an addict. No, no, can't do that. You haven't shown an act or omission. Of course, there's going to be you know, most addicts. There's some action that accounts for their acquisition of their addiction. Um, Certainly, and if not actions, then omissions, and probably a mix. Um, why, aren't, why isn't holding them, why isn't that, you show that they're an addict, why isn't that enough to be basing their liability on conduct, which includes a voluntary act or omission? It's unclear. So the, the, the statute doesn't give us any, anything really about that. It instead kind of gets an idea that somehow or another, voluntary acts and omissions are proper objects of criminal liability. We still need to know why. What is the impediment to criminal liability removed by voluntary action? So, okay. So here I have a, I have a theory about this. As you're going to find, as you find out, if you haven't found out already, of course, in this talk, I, I'm going to be asserting a lot of theories that I don't have a lot of arguments for. I'm afraid, um, or anyway, not arguments that I'm going to be able to describe in detail. Um, but here's the the theory. Uh, first of all, to understand the theory about what's important about voluntary action, you need to appreciate this other condition. Another condition of, of, of requirement on, li on criminal liability that was been referred to in the discussion um, of Doug's paper just moments ago, which I'm going to call the correspondence requirement. It's sometimes called the concurrence requirement. Here's the idea, for those of you who don't know, and apologies to those who already do. Crimes are divided into actus and mens rea elements. So the actus reus elements I'm just listing here, a bunch of conditions. Um, uh, it might be, you know, entering a dwelling at night, a variety of conditions without permission. Um, and then mens rea conditions. So these are mental states that represent in their content something in the neighborhood of each of the relevant actus reus elements. And um, so for instance, maybe you need to know that you're entering, know or be aware of a risk that the building you're entering is a dwelling, something like that, a series of mental state elements of this kind. And then there's this additional condition, which is sort of in the background, but which is incredibly important, which is this correspondence or concurrence condition, which is that you need this relation, I'm calling it here the C relation, that connects or links the relevant mental states with their relevant actus reus elements. You need something that's this relation is present just in case you have the linkage between the outward conditions of harmful or wrongful behavior and the inner conditions that are, that are constitutive of culpability. And you can see cases, and cases show up all the time, in which this correspondence requirement either is not met or seems quite unclear why it's met. Um, so this is what the example that I have here is, I think, one which is pretty clearly one in which the correspondence requirement is not met, which is 
at a particular time, D intends V dead. Acting on that intention, he goes to V's house, planning to burn it down with V in it. He arrives at V's house, and lo and behold, V's already dead, he believes. He says, screw it, I'm still going to burn down the house. He burns down the house. Um, later, an autopsy shows that, in fact, V was alive when the house was burned down. Right? Now, so is this an intentional homicide? Well, I mean, he, he, there's a death. There's causation of the death by the, by the defendant. There's a mental state that is an intention to kill at T1. There's even action in furtherance of that mental state as he travels over to the, t the house with, you know, paint, can or, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, lighter fluid in hand. And then, but what's odd, right, is that it seems as though we don't have the right connection or hookup between the inner conditions, the intention to kill, and the outward conditions, the death. Um, we don't have the right hookup for intentional homicide, although we might have the right hookup for other, I mean, there's going to be plenty of other atrocious behaviors here for which we could assign criminal liability. But that one, intentional homicide, doesn't look like it's on the table. Now, and why not? Well, because you don't have correspondence. So here's now my kind of claim. Here's why voluntary action matters to criminal liability. What voluntary action does is it's a necessary part of a complex, sufficient condition for correspondence. That is what voluntary action does. And I should say, I don't, uh, Michael Moore does not put it this way, but I think maybe you'd actually believe this. I'd actually like to hear if this is what you believe. I think you believe something closely in the neighborhood of this. But in any event, the, the idea is there's a complex condition which includes the voluntary action. And given the set of outward conditions required for the crime, the actus reus, given the, the inner conditions, the mental states, and given a voluntary act and some more stuff, and we can say a little bit about what that stuff is, then you have correspondence. That is what the voluntary act does, is it connects mental state and outward harm in the way which is going to be required for the complex of mental state and outward harm to count as something for which criminal liability is appropriate. OK. So the threat to criminal liability that is removed by voluntary action is the absence of correspondence. This is the proposal. So for instance, and, and then we can fill in quite a lot about what, about how voluntary action does this. So in the case in which there is correspondence, for instance, between an intention that V be dead and V's being dead, there's something, an intermediary, which is caused by the intention and which causes the death. Now, there are cases in which you have something which is caused by the intention and causes the death and which is insufficient for correspondence. This is familiar from Davidsonian objections to, um, to simple theories about, about intentional action. So in this version, he has the intention, he reflects on it, that agitates him. He then has a seizure in agitation. This, he knocks over a candle that burns the house. V burns. He's dead. Eh. We've got the intention, we've got the death. That can't be correspondence. We even have the causal link, can't be correspondence. Or to give you another example, D tends to be dead. D writes down in his diary, I intend to kill him. He certainly wouldn't have written that down if it weren't for the fact that he had the intention. We've got the causal link. V reads the diary, <gasps> he wants to kill me, has a heart attack and dies. Right again, this doesn't look like correspondence. Okay. Or, and notice something, this is interesting, and. It is, in fact, even insufficient to have causation of the intermediary which causes the death in instances in which the intermediary is the execution of the prior intention. So for instance, D intends V dead, he fires a gun at V, misses by a mile, cattle stampedes and crushes V. Correspondence doesn't look like it. Okay. And where I'm headed here is that there's going to be a pair of relations that, require, that you only find holding when this is a voluntary action. The first relation is what I'm going to call the mental state act relation. These, the conjunction of these two relations is correspondence. The first relation is what I'm calling the mental state act relation. It's some relation between the intention, in this case the intention, although I would hope that this will also extend to other cases in which the relevant mental state is not an intention, 
an intention and a voluntary action, and then a further relation, the fact-act relation between the voluntary action and the, for instance, the death or whatever other outward relevant outward condition of criminal liability it is. Um, I'm focusing, I'm going to focus for the rest of this talk really on the mental state act relation. Um, because that, I think, is all that we're going to need in order to understand why omissions can be proper objects of criminal liability in the same sense in which, vol in which voluntary actions are. Um, that is, the relation between, there, there, are, there are notorious problems about how the volition needs to, excuse me, how the omission needs to be related to outward harms for correspondence. Um, I'm not making any progress on understanding that relation here. But I think I will make a little progress on understanding this mental state act relation. OK, so that's where the action is. What is this mental state act relation? When does the mental state bear the, the, the right relationship to the intermediary for there to be correspondence in the instance in which there's also the right relationship between that intermediary and the outward condition? Um, Here's another, another claim without an argument. Uh, plausible. <laughs> True, I don't know. Um, that I think that an adequate account of the nature of this relationship, of this relation, will have the implication that when the relation holds, A, the voluntary act, or the bodily motion, for instance, will have the same responsibility relevant property that the mental state has. So my claim is you're going to get correspondence when whatever it is that's significant about mental state to responsibility is transferred to the action. That is, whatever is significant about that is transferred to the action just in case that relation holds between the two. That it's a culpability preserving relation. Okay? So then this then, now, so we need to know two things. We need to know what is the responsibility relevant property, and then we need to know what relation it is which transfers that property over to the act. Okay? Well, here's my proposal for what the responsibility relevant feature of the mental state is. It is, it's, an, it's that the mental state, it's an, what's important about the mental state is that it provides a very particular kind of evidence. This idea is going to intersect very closely with things that we saw yesterday in, in discussions of attributionism about responsibility. That is, it provides evidence of culpability constituting features of the defendant which I, in ways that harmonize with the views of Scanlon and Fisher and a variety of other people, would say involve a failure to properly recognize way or respond, way or respond to reasons. Which reasons? Reasons that are generated by the outward condition represented by the mental state. Okay? So the reason that mental state matters is because it tells us that the agent tells us evidences to us that the agent failed to res recognize, respond, et cetera, to the reason provided by the, st the, the feature of the world that it represents. Um, I think in this group I don't need to talk through this. I'm going to skip that for interest of time. Now this, now I want to take this kind of Scanlonian attributionist view, and I want to combine it with of Bratmanian, in, with Bratmanian insights about the nature of intention to help us to see what it is that's important about, what it is that's morally important or morally relevant about intention when it comes to culpability. Um, and that, this is the idea. Why does intention matter to culpability? Well, because what it is to have an intention is for you to be subject to a variety of rational pressures. Pressures, for instance, of consistency and means and coherence. Um, and complying with these pressures, rational pressures, affects the way in which you recognize, respond, and weigh reasons in important ways. Um, so for instance, and, and some of the ways in which you find that is in the way in which deliberation proceeds under, in the face of intention. 
in contrast to the way in which deliberation proceeds in the absence of intention. So for instance, if D intends to steal from his employer, then he should not waste time considering and deliberating about courses of conduct that are incompatible with that goal. That is, rationality requires that he not pay attention in his deliberations to a variety of forms of conduct that would be incompatible with, that, with the goal of stealing from his employer. He should ignore them. Okay. Now, of course, complying with that pressure to ignore such courses of conduct is to grant no reason giving weight in your deliberations about what to do with respect to in, in your thinking, right? You don't give any grant, to, you don't give any weight whatsoever to the fact that there's various courses of conduct which would be incompatible with your with stealing from your employer, in which there's reason to engage in. So you actually end up ignoring a set of reasons. And that and then your so your failure to you're culpable, that is, you're failing to respond properly to a set of reasons. And why are you failing to respond properly to that set of reasons? Well, because you're under a set of rational pressures from your intentions. And complying with those rational pressures is going to have you ignoring reasons that you ought to be paying attention to, granting weight to reasons that you ought to be paying attention to. So the reason, so why does intention matter to culpability? Well, because it provides this particular kind of evidence to us, evidence that the agent is, well, it, it provides, it, it first tells us that in fact the agent is, is under certain rational pressures. And then it further provides us with evidence that the agent is complying with those rational pressures. And to be complying with those rational pressures is going to be to be failing in a certain way. That is to be failing to respond, recognize, and respond properly to reasons. Okay. Now, not just any form of evidencing will do for you to find the mental state. Uh, actually, that's mm, for you to find the right. I should. This is a mistake right here. Not just any form of evidencing will you do for you to find the right relationship between mental state and underlying modes of recognition, response, and weighing of reasons. Okay. Um, why? Well, so here's the thought. That is, in general, any effort to try to understand some structure of the world which then says, ah, you have that thing in the world just in case there's an evidencing relation is at risk of conflating metaphysics with epistemology, right? I mean, you might think there's one thing about whether or not you're responsible, and then there's another thing about how you know whether or not you're responsible. And I am actually asserting, and I mean it, that part of what it is to be responsible is for there to be an epistemically, an epistemic relation between your underlying modes of, ep of response to reasons and your mental state, okay? So, first, so a first note to make this plausible is to note that not any form of evidencing will do. In particular, you've got to, it, it must be the case that the mental state evidences the underlying modes of recognition and response under a presumption of rationality, practical competence, non-alienation. So that is, and, and that's, in, notice that's exactly how, what's going on in the case of intention. What you can say is, you can't reason from the fact that he intends to steal from his employer that, for instance, he doesn't give a damn about the reasons not to, or he doesn't give a damn about his employer. You can't make that inference unless you assume that he's rational. Because for all you know, he has the intention to steal from his employer, but he's spending all his time deliberating about co courses of conduct that um, are incompatible with his stealing from his employer. That is, he might be granting reason giving weight to those things. If he's not rational, he would be doing that. So we reach the conclusion that he has these objectionable underlying modes of recognition and so on because we assume him to be, we presume him to be practically competent, rational, non-alienated agent. If we, thought he was, if we thought he was Socratic, we wouldn't be able to make the inference in quite the same way. So that is, what I want is this inference, the one on the slide here. You start with the rationality, et cetera. You note that the defendant is in a particular mental state. You note that people in that mental state who have these, who are rational in all those ways, recognize a way or respond to reasons in a particular way. That is a bad way. And so you conclude he fails to recognize and respond to reasons. Now why do you, why should I be asserting that responsibility requires evidencing of this kind? 
It's not always the case, right? You can sometimes infer people's underlying way, way they react to reasons and so on without making a presumption of their rationality. Why is it that that's so special? Well, so to see it, think about a pair of cases. So judge one does what I had on the previous slide. He infers a defect in D1's modes of transaction with reasons, given information about D1's mental states, and while presuming D1's rational, practically competent, and non-alienated. Judge two, he uses the new state-of-the-art mode of transaction with reasons detector. You stick it in the ear. You tell it that the person you know, intends harm or whatever, and then it tells you what the, uh, what the, how that person reacts to reasons. Now, I would say, if Judge 1 in, has actually discovered that D1's mental state bears on his culpability, Judge 2 has made no such discovery. He has not, for all he knows, the mental state does not have the relevant culpability relevant property. Okay? Why? Why is it that I think of it that way? Well, here's the basic thought. And this is, I'm very unhappy with what I have here, but I think I'm onto something. I don't think I quite have my finger on what I'm onto yet. But here's my thought. Remember the idea that criminal responsibility, unlike moral responsibility, requires a state with authority to hold responsible. Okay. Now, it, it seems to me extraordinarily plausible that a proper theory of political authority is going to have the following implication, which is that states have authority to hold people responsible thanks to certain facts about what rational, practically competent, non-alienated citizens Something about them. What about them? Well, maybe that they consent to be governed in a certain way, or maybe that they would approve of certain kinds of arrangements from behind the veil of ignorance, or I don't know, right? We're going to have, we need to say something. If states don't have authority unless you can say something about how rational, non autonomous agents are. Now, and so my thought is, now this is an interesting thing, right? So Because that if you think that in order for you to make an inference from a particular person's mental state to the culpability relevant features, their modes of transactions and reasons, it seems pretty plausible that, you, that the state ought to be doing that only under the assumption that the person is, as, is in, is, has the qualities thanks to which the state has authority to hold them responsible at all. OK? So why is it? that we don't have responsibility when we have the wrong kind of evidencing of underlying modes of recognition response to reasons by mental state. It's what the reason is, is because we do not there have the kind of activity on the, the possibility of the kind of activity on the part of the state which they're required to do in order, in order to hold responsible. I think it's very unclear whether the same kind of line of thought would apply when there's moral rather than criminal responsibility at issue. That is, I strongly suspect, for instance, that Scanlonian attributionism requires Scanlonian contractualism, which may not be true, his, the contractualism, but something like that has to be true of law, it seems to me. OK, now, now the next step. So remember, right, there was two parts. Identify the responsibility relevant feature of the mental state. Then figure out what relation the mental state needed to be in to the intermediary for the intermediary to also have that same property, that same responsibility relevant property. So I've told you what I think the, the, the relevant property of the mental state is. It has to evidence these modes of transaction with reasons under a certain kind of, it has to evidence them in a particular way. So now what I want is that that when the mental stat state act relation is present, the intermediary too evidences that and in the same way. Okay? And then when you look, you realize, oh, here's a, at least in the paradigm case, an, an action that's ex executing of an intention has that feature. It makes it possible, the action evidencing, um, the action ex in execution of the intention makes it possible to infer, under presumptions of rationality and so on, what 
how it is that the agent recognizes and responds to reasons. So D fires a gun at V in execution of an intention that V die. Okay, You assume rationality, practical competence, and all that. And then what we're able to infer from the act, the firing of the gun, given information about the intention, is that D recognizes ways or responds to reasons in a way which is completely messed up. That is, he gives no negative, he gives no, does not give appropriate reason giving weight to the fact of V's death. Okay? I would say that is, it's not the whole story, but it's part of the story of why it is that D is culpable. That is, it's halfway towards establishing the right kind of correspondence between D's mental state and the death. The other half is going to be that we have to have the right kind of connection between the firing of the gun and the death. So in the case in which what happen, the way it works is through the stampede, well, the problem with that is that when there's the stampede, then the death is not something which, from which we can infer under presumptions of rationality and so on that there are in the background these problematic modes of recognition and response to reasons. Um, okay, so that's, that's the whole story then about what is significant. What is the obstacle to criminal liability that is removed by voluntary action? Voluntary action probably uniquely allows us to can inherit well, not uniquely, because it's also going to be true of some omissions, but voluntary action inherits the, the morally interesting property of the mental state, which is a particular evidential power. Um, and that's why when we, have, when we also have the, a relation which allows the culpab culpability preservation into the outward conditions, such as the death, that we have correspondence. OK. I think I have time. How much time do I have? Probably not enough. Uh, I'm not going to explain why, but I think the same kind of inference will be available even when the mental state is not an intention. If someone wants to talk about that, they are welcome to. I might be wrong. Okay. Uh, this summarizes what I have already said. Let me move a little further then. Okay. Now, so let's move then to the case of absence. Because remember the strategy, the strategy was to say, Look, we want to know which absences are omissions. Well, what is it for an absence to be an omission? Well, I don't know, but here's one of the things that it has to do. It has to make possible criminal liability in the same way that voluntary action makes possible criminal liability. Now we have on, a story, on the table a story as to what it is about voluntary action that makes possible or removes an impediment to criminal liability. Let's see under the conditions under which absences can do the same thing. So now here's the thing to notice, which is when you start looking at what intentions require of you rationally, you find that they often require absences. Oops. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. Um, <laughs> We have a problem, so we're downloading all your data to our server. <laughs> so, um, so often intentions require absences. That is what rationality requires of you frequently when you have a particular intention, is that you not do something. This was in fact true in, my, in the earlier example that I gave in which what it does is it screens out certain kinds of, consider, certain kinds of conduct for consideration and deliberation. That is, it tells you don't think about that when you're deliberating. It's a waste of your time. It's inconsistent with what, you're, with what you're intending. This is one of the benefits of intention. It makes deliberation easier by not, allow, by, not, by not forcing us to weigh and consider all kinds of courses of conduct that are incompatible with what we intend. Um, so, for instance, D intends V dead. D knows, let's say in our example, that if he doesn't stop the lethal force, V will die. So he doesn't stop the lethal force, so V dies. Now, so there's an absence. The absence is, what's absent is the stopping of the lethal force. What do we know about the stopping of the lethal force? The not stop, excuse me, the absence is 
D's compliance with the norm of rationality imposed on him by his intention, means end, means end coherence, he is under rational pressure for it to be the case that it is absent, his stopping of the lethal force is absent. So he is now thereby complying thanks to the fact that this is absent. He's complying with the norm of rationality imposed on him by his intention. Okay. Similarly, right? notice thinking about asking yourself, gee, should I stop the lethal force? That's a resource consuming activity. Given that you intend the death, and given that the lethal force is there, why waste the resources, right? If we were designing a creature that was going to be as deliberatively efficient as possible, we would design a creature that was smart enough not to think about whether or not to stop lethal forces in instances in which they intend deaths. Better yet, no, don't even think about it. Go about your business. Then what will happen? The world will come to match your intention. Wouldn't that be terrific? Right? So in this instance, even the not thinking about stopping the lethal force would itself be an instance of compliance with the norm of rationality imposed by your intention. Okay? And notice, given that those are the norms of rationality that are governing you, we learn a lot about how you recognize and respond to reasons. That is, we recognize all sorts of things about the ways in which you fail to recognize reasons that you ought to recognize. Okay? And then, so this is my suggestion. That's what it is to omit in the relevant sense omit in the sense that matters for criminal liability. That is, you omit if there's an absence, thanks to the fact that there's an absence, or, I mean, I, I hate this language, but I might say thanks to the fact that the following proposition is true, that the absence, given the absence, D complies with the norm of rationality that applies to him because of one of his intentions, and given that Compliance with that, with that norm of rationality bears on the question of whether these modes of recognition, weighing, and response to reasons are compatible with proper appreciation of the reason-giving force of some salient fact. Which one? Well, the one that's going to be specified by some independent mental state. Then that's the case in which you have an omission. That is, that's the case in which you have something which serves to remove the obstacle to criminal liability of exactly the same sort and in exactly the same way that voluntary action removes that obstacle. Um, okay, let me just say a couple concluding things. So, well, really just two or something. So, is this a solution to the omission problem? So, when I originally wrote this draft and I sent it to Kim, poor Kim, <laughs> um, uh, I, I thought this was a solution to the, match, the omission problem. The more I thought about it, actually, I don't think it is, really is a solution to the omissions problem. Not, not quite. Um, that is, it's an, app, it's an account of how an absence can play the same functional role in supporting criminal liability that an act plays. That's what it is. But what I haven't actually done, I think I actually may be in exactly the same place of uncertainty that Michael Zimmerman was at the end of his talk, although I'm not entirely sure. But that is, here's what I haven't, what I haven't figured out, because right? I simply have not, not, not supplied it, and it seems like a full solution to the mission problem would require it, which is that I haven't provided an account of the difference between non-occurrences that allow us to credit the agent with compliance with the norm of rationality, and non-occurrences which place the agent in conformity with such a norm, but not in a way which earns him any credit. Okay? So, for instance, imagine we've got two people D1, D2, they both intend to be dead. Lethal force is going to do the job for them if neither of them does anything. Neither of them gives any thought to stopping lethal force. Neither of them stops lethal force. V dies. Okay. But imagine that we have really different explanations for why D2 didn't think to stop lethal force and D1 did. That is, in one of the cases, we have an explanation that notes the intention that V die, that is in the case of D1, and in the other, in the other instance, we don't have that. So both of them are under rational pressure not to think about it and not to do it. But you might think there are going to be cases in which one of them, they're not thinking about it and they're not doing it, can be explained in a way which doesn't actually have anything to do with the norms of rationality imposed on them by their intentions. 
And then, then it stops looking like it's actually that the omission is serving to connect the mental state, in this case the intention, with the death, even though the absence doesn't do the trick. So now I need to know why not. Since both of them are actually in compliance with the norms of rationality imposed on, their, on them by their intention. And I don't have an account of that. My fear, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know whether the, I don't know how, how bad the problem would be, but my fear is that if I'm going to really understand this, that the solution to this problem actually just is the omission problem. I mean, in which case, I'm not sure, well, well what have I done? I've explained something about how you get glue between mental state and outward conditions for criminal liability, and I've explained how an absence can do that, but I actually haven't told you what the difference is between omissions and non-omissions. Um, at least that's my, my fear. Uh, is that the last slide? Yeah, that was the last slide. Um, thanks. <laughs>